Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi, thank you for coming. My name is Mikita Protsenko. I'm a backend engineer in Roku. I work in the billing team. And today I'm going to talk about how we manage infrastructure as code using Gradle and Terraform. And before I begin, I want to thank my team and my manager, Shabana Radha Krishnan, for helping me to prepare this talk for providing valuable feedback. It's appreciated. Okay, I'm going to go through the history of the problems we had when we started managing infrastructure as code. I will talk about different solutions we tried and about the errors we made along the way. And I hope you will leave this talk with a better idea how to automate your infrastructure. When we started migrating from monolith architecture to microservices, we faced a problem. We needed to provision ton of AWS resources, elastic load balancers, EC2 instances, ECS services, you name it, in different environments, dev, QA, staging, production. So let's take a look at the scope of the problem. Let's take a look at the actual numbers. One project on average defines about 12 different AWS resources, from load balancers to RDS instances to CloudWatch alarms in three environments, that is 36. And five projects, it me, they mean 180 AWS resources in all environments, and 10 projects, 360, and so on, because we keep growing. And first, oops, first we tried doing this manually, and of course we ended up with a huge mess. <laughs> uh, then we tried cloud formation. We try to describe our resources in a more formal, more automated way, and it was a great step forward. We had something we could check in. We had something we could use as a source of truth. But in my, in my opinion, there was one problem. Let's take a look at this example. It describes a DNS entry. It describes an entry type, a time to leave, a reference to Route 53 zone, a reference to an EC2 instance, and so on and so on. Does it look simple? Does it look easy to read or understand? Uh, I don't think so. Don't get me wrong, I love cloud formation. I do think it is great. But I just don't feel that it was written to be used by humans. I feel like it was written to be used by robots. Angry robots that really hate humanity. <laughs> Then we discovered Terraform, and it was a great experience. First of all, it feels like it's written for humans by humans, namely by HashiCorp, who is, which is already famous for a bunch of other DevOps tools. I believe everybody at least familiar with Vagrant. It has great documentation and community. I strongly recommend checking out the website. So let me give you another example. This is the same DNS entry written as a Terraform script. Much easier to read. We have the same type, the same TTL, the same reference. But now it's human readable. Feel the difference. This is written for humans, and this is for angry robots. OK, a few more words about Terraform. So what is Terraform? What does it do? Terraform allows you to define your infrastructure as easy to read source file. These files can be checked in along with your code. They can be shared. They can be reused. So here you can see an example of a very simple Terraform script, which defines an S3 bucket. So first of all, you can see that the resource type is defined here. Then you can see the resource name. It is internal to Terraform. Basically, you can treat it as a Terraform variab internal variable. And after that, you see the resource properties and settings. So for S3 bucket, it might be a name. For EC2 instance, it might be instant instance type, a VPC ID, a subnet, whatever is needed to define your resource. And Terraform can take in variables to be used as your script's input. Uh, their values can be provided through environment variables or through property files. Here you can see a modified script that takes in an arbitrary name for an S3 bucket. Whatever you provide for the variable, it will be used as a bucket name. For example, you may use it to use different buckets for different environments because bucket names have to be unique. 
And Terraform resources may reference each other. So here's an, you, you may see another example. And AWS Lambda function actually referencing an S3 bucket here. And Terraform can define outputs. So other projects can reference the resources you created. Here's another example. Uh, so once you define an output, other projects can reference the S3 bucket defined by, by your script. And you can organize your Terraform scripts in multiple files. What Terraform does, it picks up all, all the files with the .tf extension uh, from your target directory. And basically, you can go ahead and organize your resources by type. For example, you can put RDS-related resources in one file and CloudWatch alarms in another file. It makes it easier to manage. And Terraform is smart enough to build a dependency graph for your resources. And then it just go, goes ahead and deploys them in the right order. Two main Terraform commands, your daily bread and butter, are plan and apply. If you use our sample.tf file that defines an S3 bucket, and if we provide a, a value for the bucket name and then we run Terraform plan, we'll get a list of pending infrastructure changes. You can see we're about to add one S3 bucket here, and we can inspect the property the properties of the resource to be added before we actually proceed. So we, if, we dis, uh, if we discover an error, like something is misdefined here, we can pull the plug before it's actually deployed. And then after we try Terraform apply, we actually go and provision our infrastructure. It means it's actually created in the cloud. This step will also update your Terraform state. And what is the Terraform state? Basically, Terraform state is just the record of what has been provisioned already. So Terraform state, it maps real-world resources to your configuration. It keeps track of its metadata. So uh, why do you need it? Um, well, if you change your script, uh, Terraform can compare it with your state and provision only the delta. Basically, if you run Terraform apply using the same script again, no changes will be made. But if you go ahead and edit the sample TF file and add another bucket, for example, and run Terraform apply again, only the second bucket will be created next time you run it. So looks good, right? The problem here is that your state is stored locally by default. Things got better on this front recently. Uh, I will talk about it later. So why storing the state locally is a problem? Well, what if you accidentally go ahead and delete or change the local state? Or what if somebody else wants to make and deploy changes to infrastructure? They don't have the state you have. They don't know what was provisioned already and what is yet to be provisioned. So they can run into the situation when they try to create something that is already there. They get an error. The state might be corrupted. So you need to figure out who's wrong, who's right. So basically, the question is, how do you share the state? Fortunately, Terraform provides a mechanism for that, a remote state. To make sure your state is stored remotely, for example, in an S3 bucket, and is accessible to other projects, um, you need to configure it explicitly using this Terraform command. And Terraform provides a range, a wide range of available backends. Uh, so you can store your remote state like in console, in S3, uh, but we ended up using S3. After all, we already hosted everything else in AWS, so it kind of made sense for us. And then we wanted to make it a part of our build pipeline. Uh, we wanted to build a tool that gives power back to the developers. We were seriously understaffed on the infrastructure front. Uh, our ratio of developers to DevOps were, was 5 to 1, 7 to 1 at one point. So we wanted to make sure that developers have tools to provision infrastructure they need without having to wait for anybody. We didn't want the infrastructure team to become a bottleneck. Instead, we wanted to shift uh, uh, some of their daily tasks to developers themselves so we could scale. And scaling humans is hard. So we wanted to automate everything that could be automated and make sure that the developers have something that is powerful but is reasonably easy to use. And we also wanted to minimize deployment time. 
if the process takes too long, more than a few dozen seconds, it becomes a burden you want to avoid. Developers will try not to use your tool if it's slow, and the whole effort you spend creating it will be wa wasted. So minimize interaction was an absolute priority. And we wanted to provide a safety net and some level of oversight. Terraform is a really powerful tool. It lets you make mistakes a thousand times faster. We wanted to make sure you don't accidentally provision 300 uh, of EC2 instances because you drank too much coffee today and typed the wrong number, or delete a security group because you didn't get enough sleep. And if you delete a security group, you may prevent services from talking to watch another. You, you can do a lot of damage. So we wanted to have a sort of safety fuse there. Basically, we wanted to have a tool that will, A, configure Terra mode remote state, put it into S3 bucket, make sure it's encrypted because the state may contain uh, uh, important data like passwords, credentials. Then do Terraform plan so we can review the pending changes and pull the, the plug if something goes wrong. And then do Terraform apply to actually provision the infrastructure. And when we started thinking about implementing and evolving our tooling, we had to think about evolution because Terraform is a very dynamic project and we had to keep up with pace of changes in it. Uh, so Grade was a very obvious choice for us. We already used it to build our Java code and we were very happy with it. Uh, it took us a few iterations to figure everything out and I still think we haven't figured everything. I still think it's not the end of our journey. Uh, I believe we're like here somewhere. <laughs> It's a good place to, it's a fun place to be. Uh, at first, we implemented a very naive solution. We checked in Terraform configuration and the shell script to maintain Terraform state and run uh, plan and apply commands. And then we added Gradle tasks to just go ahead and run pre-configured Terraform commands and it kind of worked. So what's wrong with this picture? Right, if you have to change something, for example, like you need to adjust uh, Terraform state configuration logic, you need to add an encryption layer on top of this, you have to go to all the projects and make a change in the scripts and commit the changes to each project that is out there. Uh, fortunately, we caught this problem early enough when we just had two or three projects that were using this approach. So the next obvious step was setting up a Gradle plugin and we went ahead and we wrapped Terraform management shell script in a Gradle plugin. We named it Henka, which is Japanese for change. And by using Gradle dependency resolution mechanism, we made sure that you can get the plugin updates when you need it in a fast and safe manner. So basically, if you need to update it, you can just change the version or you can use dynamic version to get the latest and greatest stuff. So let's take a look how it works. The plugin provides you with a Terraform task type and you can create a task uh, which you can configure to reflect your project needs. So here's an example. First of all, we need to specify a directory with Terraform scripts that we'll use to describe the actual infrastructure. Then we specify a file that has the environment specific externalized configuration so we can provide values for Terraform variables. Then we specify action, plan or apply so we can choose to review our changes before we proceed or we can go ahead and actually deploy them. And finally, we describe remote state configuration. We set up S3 bucket uh, that we'll store our remote state in, the key, the KMIS key we'll use to encrypt it. And as a result, we have a task called Terraform and it can accept arguments from a command line or it can be tweaked to pick up the values from environments, uh, environment variables if it's more to your liking. So let's take a look how it works. Here's an example. Let's say we have our Terraform script, sample.tf, defining an S3 bucket, which we just reviewed. And after running this Gradle task, we are going to get this result. It says, like, it's about to create one S3 bucket. And under the hood, it just runs a Terraform plan command and sets up a remote state, basically leaving you free to just go ahead and configure your Terraform configuration. And the whole thing looks very similar to a plain Terraform command. 
And this is done on purpose because if you know Terraform, um, the effort to pick up the plugin is very minimal. We just wanted to minimize traction. And after you're done reviewing the changes, you apply them with this Gradle task. And voila, the bucket is created. And the fact that it's created is recorded in the remote Terraform state. Uh, works well, right? Yeah, we did. But another problem with this approach was that it required Terraform to be installed on each and every box. It was a maintenance hell that we faced eventually. We had to make sure that all involved parties have Terraform installed, that Terraform binary is on their path, that Terraform they have is of the right version, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we ran into this problem when we wanted to use a feature that came with the newest Terraform release, and oops, suddenly we had to upgrade Terraform on a bunch of boxes. Well, fortunately, all we had to do is to fix the plugin and release a new version of it and just tell, tell the developers to go and pick it up. And the, the whole process was rather painless. And yep, the next logical step in the next uh, uh, plugin version was to make sure that Terraform itself is managed by Gradle as well. We added a couple of configuration options to make sure that we can install the exact version of Terraform exactly where we want it. The plugin checks if it is there and if it's of the right version, and if it's not there, it will download Terraform and install it into the specified directory. It doesn't download the same version twice, so you don't have to worry about the build speed or bandwidth usage. It's smart enough. And as I mentioned in the beginning, our tooling had to evolve along with the Terraform itself. And recently, uh, Terraform added a few very notable features like remote backends and state locking. And some of the existing features, uh, like modules, became mature enough for us to start using them as well. So I'm going to talk about these new features here. Uh, we don't support them in the mainline yet. We support them in the beta version of the plugin. But it is there. So first, a couple of words about modules. Uh, Terraform modules allow you to organize and reuse common pieces of your infrastructure. Basically, you can think of them as of Terraform subprojects. For example, if every microservice you have needs an RDS instance and a CPU usage alarm, then instead of copy-pasting definitions of these AWS resources, you can pull them out and put them into a separate module and reference them in your project, eliminating duplication. And modules are configurable. Similar to regular projects, they can define input variables and outputs. So for example, if you want to configure a different threshold on a CPU alarm for different services, you can just define it as an input variable in your module and set it in, in the referencing project. And while Terraform provides quite a few options for storing modules, including, of course, S3 buckets, the best way to store them is using Git. Terraform supports Git, and it can even use different tags while referencing modules. So you can use Git tags to basically version your modules. So this way, you can be sure that your project doesn't pick up an incompatible change from the new major update of the module. Well, unless you feel lucky and in this case, you can just get rid of this version altogether. The trick is, uh, the trick is that before running any Terraform command for the configuration that actually uses modules, you need to run Terraform get first, so, so it can go out and import the modules and actually use them in your configuration. Uh, well, it has to actually download them before to proceed and incorporate it into the configuration metadata. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is remote backends. As you remember, to instantiate a remote state in Terraform, we had to run this command. It was not very convenient. It was okay, like it worked for us, but it was not very convenient because we had to provide this command with a lot of project-specific data, like which uh, S3 key to use to store remote state 
uh, it really belongs to the project, not, not to the externalized configuration. And also we have created a very tight coupling with S3. It wasn't a big problem for us, but it prevented any experiments with any other backend storage mechanisms and even we couldn't use uh, new options in the S3 storage mechanism without rewriting the, this logic and releasing a new plugin. Fortunately, Terraform 0.9 added a very useful feature, remote backends. Now you can define a remote state as a part of your configuration and just check it in. So let's take a look at this example. We're still using S3 remote state. And if we want, we can experiment with other solutions. We are no longer bound to AWS. And the primary motivation of this experiment was that some of the remote backends support locking, and that includes S3. Uh, and locking was a very useful feature. With state locking, you can make sure that there are no race conditions uh, when you deploy your infrastructure. So imagine if two developers try to deploy infrastructure changes simultaneously and one of them provision a resource and then the second one tries to provision the same resource and it gets an error and it can even corrupt the remote state that is out there by recording this error. State locking allows you to get rid of it. And an interesting thing is that if you want to externalize some of this configuration, you can Terraform backends, Terraform remote state, uh, support partial, uh, partial configuration. You can just specify commons part of your configuration in your source files and provide the rest as the command line arguments to Terraform init command. So here you can see that bucket itself is commented out. So we may provide different buckets for, for different environments in the common line while keeping the rest, the, the, common, uh, the common parts of the remote state configuration in the project itself. And yes, if you use remote backends, you have to run Terraform init command to set up your state before you do anything else. And fortunately, this command is idempotent, so we could run it multiple times safely. So we decided, okay, let's add it to the Gradle plugin, let's add it to Hanka, so it will be run automatically before each operation, just to be safe. And this way, you don't have to think about it. And to enable all this goodness, we had to provide developer access to Terraform commands we just reviewed, Terraform get, Terraform init, and more. Like, there is, a, there is a ton of Terraform features that people might or might not need. And we decided, okay, it's not for us to actually decide. And as a result, we had to replace this old flow, which was like configure remote state, put it into S3, encrypt it, then do Terraform plan to review the changes, then do Terraform apply to actually provision the changes. This, this flow no longer worked for us because like, we had to tweak it um, uh, and we decided, okay, we don't even know how we should tweak it because different projects might need different flows. And we decided to replace it with this guy. So first of all, we made Terraform version required. So uh, the first step, uh, is the plugin always take care about the installing the right Terraform version. Then we got read about enforcing the actual, the concrete remote state policy through the plugin. Developers now can define their own backends. It means they are not longer limited to AWS storage anymore. Though the plugin does make sure that the remote state is set up before running any command. And finally, the last step in the flow is actually running a Terraform command. And the command itself is an arbitrary Terraform command, no longer limited to plan and apply, so people can leverage the full power of Terraform. So here's an example of the new Terraform task configuration. First, we define Terraform version and the folder to install it in. Uh, then, uh, we pick up the directory with the project Terraform configuration. Uh, we pick up the arbitrary Terraform command from uh, project properties, so we can provide it as a command line argument and we are no longer bound with plan and apply, we can provide any command we want. 
And as you can see, you can still enforce backend state configuration, but you have much more power now. If you want to switch a state backend from S3 to console, you just need to edit your backend configuration in your Terraform scripts. And if you need to put additional external S configuration, you can do this by providing TF init params so you can put this externalized configuration there. So instead of this huge manual mess or scripts written for angry robots, we had this nice build flow. The init command is done automatically under the hood so you don't even see it here. Uh, then we do plan, then if we need to click the approve button, make sure like the human actually goes and, do, uh, and does something before we provision the changes, we just edit here, probably as a part of Jenkins pipeline. Uh, and if you need to customize this flow, more power to you. You can leverage any Terraform command that it is there. So for example, if you want to use modules in your configuration, you can just add another step here. You can run the Terraform get command. And we consider it using Gradle task dependencies to make sure that build steps are executed in the right order. It's very easy to do just by creating separate tasks of Terraform task type for each step and using Gradle task dependencies, basically adding depends on. Uh, we decided not doing this yet because we didn't want to, like we, we basically didn't know which flow is the right one, so we didn't want to limit people. Uh, the option is still on the table though, so if anybody wants to try it out, feel free. To sum it up, let me share a few tips and tricks that will make managing your infrastructure easier. First of all, set up a remote state in all your projects. Latest Terraform versions support a wide range of possible backends from console to S3. Uh, also enforce locking so you cannot accidentally run into situations when two developers try making changes simultaneously and step on each other's toes. You probably want to avoid that. Uh, put safety first. If you use S3 for your remote backend, make sure that the bucket uh, you store it in is versioned. So if something goes wrong, you can always roll back to the latest known good state and repair any errors that might be there. Uh, also, set up a change review project. Uh, as I said before, Terraform is a very powerful tool and you have to use it wisely because infrastructure errors may be very costly. It may be one of the most costly errors you ever make. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of running a plan command and reviewing results before applying any change, no matter how small. And besides regular changes, make sure to watch out for first deletions. Uh, watch out for deletions. Make sure you're not breaking anything. The most common problems with deletions is changing a name of a resource accidentally. Uh, sometimes a name cannot be changed without, the, without deleting and then recreating the resource. And that means downtime and you want to avoid that, especially in production. Uh, also watch out for extra costs uh, when adding new resources. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a, a cluster of EC2 instances, you may want uh, to consider making a number of your instances configurable. So you may have one instance for QA environment and 50 instances for production environment. So you don't end up paying extra for the resources you don't actually use in QA. Um, another example, you may want to watch out for uh, read and write capacity uh, of your DynamoDB tables. Again, you probably don't want to provision a lot of capacity in your development environments. Uh, okay, project infrastructure versus core infrastructure. This point is related to safety, but it's important enough on its own. To make your infrastructure more robust, you may want to set up a separate project to configure your most critical infrastructure parts, like security groups, IAM policies, VPCs, network configurations, ECS cluster, basically everything that is shared by all the projects. Then you can define a project-specific infrastructure in the project itself, along with your code. If we're talking about containerized deployment, 
it's usually a load balancer, a task definition, and elastic container service, a few CloudWatch alarms, an RDS instance, or the neighbor table, maybe. Uh, and if you go this way, you make sure that even if you make a mistake in your project, and even if it slips through, you, it doesn't bring the whole system down. Uh, also, you may want to uh, make review and release process for your core infrastructure more strict. Think nuclear launch codes, right? You may want to have like two people pressing the approve button before you deploy the core infrastructure changes. Uh, to make your builds debuggable, you need to make them repeatable, and that includes your infrastructure builds. Uh, the way to get it is to have all Terraform tasks and dependencies defined in your Gradle script. Make sure that all inputs can be provided as command line arguments or environment variables. Originally, we tried using property files, but we had so many problems with that, so we decided to dish it out because it's really hard to, to distribute those. Um, make sure that your build system actually goes out and calls a Terraform Gradle task that it doesn't try to bypass Gradle. This way you can easily debug any issues on your local box. Just set up a couple of variables, you run your Gradle Terraform tasks, and you're good to go. You don't have to wait for the Jenkins job to complete. You don't have to click through several web screens to get the output. You don't have to wait for the check-in and the build to complete. And uh, also you can use any build system you like, Jenkins, Travis CI, Team City, because by the end of the day, all it does is call in a few Terraform commands. It's basically just a plain shell script. It doesn't matter where you run it, as long as it has the same inputs. So uh, this is all I have to share for today. So if you're interested to managing your infrastructure's code, if you're interested in making sure that you don't have to wait for anybody to actually provision the stuff that you need in the cloud, uh, here are the links that you may want to find useful. And um, I guess we can take, I, I can take a few questions. Okay. Uh, oh. So um, you mentioned like one of the tips was to separate project versus core infrastructure. Yes. Um, and you mentioned like one example is like the BPC, for example. Uh, let's say in your project you want to put an instance in your BPC. How do you link, you know, the core infrastructure to the project? Like, do you just copy manually the, the BPC ID? That's that, that's a very good question. Basically, every uh, resource you define, every property of every resource you define, you can define as your Terraform output. And when you set up that remote state, your project, your actual projects, may reference the outputs of your core projects by hitting these remote states and pulling this in. So basically, this is the right uh, way to do this. Be because otherwise, you have to copy paste a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. I would be interested in like, getting more details about how to import uh, Sure. Uh, like, maybe, maybe I'll find uh, Sure, find me after the talk and I can like, show you the, the actual scripts that I cannot show here because of NDA. Okay. <laughs> okay, I guess we're done. Thanks a lot. Thank you for coming here. <laughs>